Dr. Lokesh Kumar Anand, sir, is the chairperson for this session. Sir is professor in Olana Medical College, Ambala. And area of interest are airway management, resuscitation, critical care, trauma anesthesia. And sir have many achievements and many publications. Over to you, sir. Sir, are you there? So can you please introduce the speaker? The, uh, the slide of uh, the parul is not... Yeah, over to Yeah. So uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Parul. Uh, just hold on. Dr. Parul is uh, uh, from Himachal Institute of Medical Sciences, and uh, she has an uh, interest in the difficult theory of obstetric anesthesia, PG, uh, PG teaching, and uh, so various platforms as a guest speaker, and uh, so many so societies. So I invite uh, Dr. Parul to, she'll be talking about very important monitoring that is the basic basics of pulse oximetry and its clinical impl implications. And this should include the Massimo technique and perfusion index that is a important for area for Massimo is a, one of the important technique in pulse oximetry. Over to Dr. Parul. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Parul Jindal from Himal Institute of Medical Sciences, Dehradun. I've been assigned the topic pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry might come to you as a short note or it might be asked your own viva. So we all know that pulse oximetry or SPO2 along with pain is the fifth vital sign and it is a non-invasive method to estimate hemoglobin saturation by oxygen by transmitting a light signal through the tissues. ABG is a gold standard for measuring PO2, but it can be costly, painful, it may lead to bleeding and thrombosis and infection. In 1937, Hertzman AB gave the photoelectric uh, plethysmography of the fingers and the toes. The Oyaki, in 1974, he invented the pulse oximeter, which has revolutionized the critical care medicine. Mathis is called as the father of pulse oximetry because he used it in the clinical practice. And in 1983, Yelderman and Mew uh, discovered the Nelcor pulse oximeter. Early, the pulse oximeters were used on the ear and they were cumbersome and required prior arterialization by heat and chemical treatment. And they failed to discriminate between the arterial venous and tissue blood flow. The basic principle of pulse oximeter is that it is based on two technologies. One is spectrophotometry, which measures hemoglobin oxygen saturation, and optical uh, plethysmography, which measures the pulsatile changes in arterial blood volume at the sensor site. The spectrophotometry is based on the Beer Lambert uh, law, which states that all atoms and molecules they absorb specific wavelength of light. The absorption of light when it passes by a medium is proportional to the concentration of the substance and the length of the path. 
We know that there are four types of hemoglobin which behave like different materials and absorb the different light differently. They are oxyhemoglobin, reduced hemoglobin, methemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia. The oxygen saturation is defined as the oxygen content which is expressed as a percentage of oxygen capacity. So by this definition, methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin cannot be included and this is the origin of the term which is called as this functional SaO2 or functional SpO2. Now, uh, the extension of these coefficients of carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin are not zero in the red and infrared rays and their presence will therefore contribute to some sort of absorption. And when methemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin are pre uh, present in appreciable amount, the readings would be RNS. So we have the concept of fractional SpO2. Now let's take the uh, principle of uh, pulse oximeter with this diagram. In this there is light which is in two uh, wavelengths that is 660 nanometers and 940 nanometers and this light passes through the tissue. Now it uh, strikes against a pulsatile arteriole and there is a change in the phasic intensity of this monochromatic light and this light will change the uh, intense this uh, change intensity will strike the photodiode and is analyzed the light which has not stuck the pulsatile arterial like the, that with the veins or the intervening tissue there is no phasic change in the intensity and the photodiode will not analyze this light so the problem of isolating the arterial single is handled very differently today so in order to estimate the concentration of light absorbing substances in a clear solution from the intensity of the light transmitted, we use this formula, the intensity of transmitted light is equal to intensity of incident light minus the absorption of that light. Now that A is equal to distance uh, light is transmitted to the liquid, concentration of the solute and the extension coefficient of the solute. Today, the, uh, there is a microprocessor which can select out the absorption of the pulsatile fraction of blood that is uh, due to the arterialized blood and the constant absorption by the non-pulsatile venous or capillary blood which is the DC. So uh, thus eliminating the effect of tissue absorption to measure the oxygen saturation of arterial blood. So these are the uh, this is what you see on the screen the plethysmograph and let's just divide it what happens. We have a foot that is the beginning of the pulse when the flow starts in the systolic phase and then it is marked by the systolic peak which is the maximum peak flow uh, following the systole. At the end of the ejection and closing of the aortic valve you have a diacrotic notch and then which is followed by a diastolic peak which is the wave reflection due to vascular resistance. The uh, pulse oximeter can be divided into two types. The transmission type which is the most common. There the light beam is transmitted through the vascular bed and is detected on the opposite sides. The second is the reflectance where there are two monochrome lights that is the 660 and 940 nanometers which are given out from the LED and they are bounced back or backscattered to reach the area adjacent to the LED. For some of the examples are the forehead reluctance, uh, reflectance pulse oximeter which is more stable to changes in blood and to motion artifacts, fetal scalp monitoring and gastric mucosa oh. reflectance pulse oximeter which gives us a good idea about the GIT perfusion. So where can we use the pulse oximeter? It can be used for monitoring the oxygenation, peripheral circulation, vascular volume and sympathetic uh, tone and to avoid hyperoxia. For monitoring the oxygenation, there is a reduction in number of hypoxic events during the uh, induction and intubation. It can be used to detect the bronchial intubation by fall in SpO2, but this is not a very reliable method, especially if the supplemental oxygen is given. It can be used for monitoring the efficacy of ventilation during uh, one lung ventilation. Sometimes during the regional anesthesia, the patient is restless and we confuse it with the signs and symptoms of hypoxia. And uh, this patient might be restless because of inadequate uh, block. And uh, instead of uh, giving oxygen, we give him uh, sedation. And this may compound the problem further. There might be a sudden decrease in SpO2 because of pulmonary or fat embolism. Disconnection of the circuit, oxygen delivery is failed, the endotracheal tube is obstructed or kinked, there's a hypoxic gas mixture, the patient may develop pulmonary edema or anaphylaxis and malignant hypothermia.
It can be used for monitoring the peripheral circulation. Suppose if the patient is in the lithotomy position, so any detection in the decrease in the perfusion of the toe might tell you that the peripheral circulation is compromised or the, it may detect the arm position that compromises the circulation. The brachial artery compression may take place during the shoulder arthroscopy. There might be a compromised peripheral circulation distal to the site of fracture and to evaluate this effect of sympathetic block as indicated during the fall of uh, increase in SVO2 due to vasodilatation. But we might even determine the systolic blood pressure. Uh, a BP cuff and SPO2 probe are at the same time, uh, are at the same arm, and we inflate the cuff till the pressure uh, where the SPO2 waveform is lost. So that will give us our systolic blood pressure. We, if we inflate the cuff well past the systolic BP and look for appearance of waveform as we deflate the cuff in children, this method was found to be more accurate than uh, the um, more accurate than the NIBP. It has been uh, used in the sleep study in the 24-hour ambulatory recording for the SpO2. It is useful for screening of for daytime sleep sequelae associated with potential risk of this pathology in OSA patients during social activities. It can be used for monitoring the sympathetic tone and vascular volume. Uh, the waveform amplitude, it is proportional to the vascular distensibility during anesthesia. And this may be used to determine the extent of attenuation of sympathetic response to the stimuli. There might be a correlation between the pulse waveform amplitude and hypovolemia during IPP. It may be used to avoid hyperoxia in infants or especially the neonates, giving the oxygen may be associated with retinopathy and other pathological changes. So SpO2 titrates the inspired oxygen to minimum by detecting the hyperoxemia. So what are the sites of SpO2 probe application? The most common site is the finger. There is a less failure rate and more accurate as compared to the earlobe. It is very sens uh, sensitive to sympathetic vasoconstriction. In cases of poor circulation of finger block, a vasodilator may be given to improve the performance. There could be detection of saturation and desaturation slower. The motion artifacts are less if thumb is used and the position of the arm if arm is raised the SpO2 decreases. The ear and tongue is useful in uh, finger motion. They have a faster response time than the finger probe. The ear is relatively immune to vasoconstrictive effect of the sympathetic nervous system and to increase the uh, fusion you can rub the ear for 45 seconds or uh, with alcohol or it can be heated. The tongue can be used in extensive burn patients and they are more resistant to signal interference from electrocautery units. The oral secretion or venous congestion uh, due to head down positions are main problem. In infants, you can apply it over, over the toes. The detection of saturation and desaturation is slower and it takes around one to two minutes, uh, but it provides a reliable signal in case of epidural block. The pharyngeal oximeter can be attached to the laryngeal mask and it is useful in poor perfusion status. During, uh, it can also be applied on the nose, and especially on the nasal bridge and the nostrils. And it is recommended in cases of hypothermia, hypotension and vasoconstriction. Uh, reflectance uh, pulse oximeter can be applied either on the forehead or on the esophagus. In the esophagus, as it is a core organ, it has better perfusion than the extremities. So it is very useful in cases of hypoperfusion, shock, hypovolemia. It can also be used in cases of extensive burns. It is very accurate, but a placement um, is a, a lot of practice is required when you're trying to place it. For the forehead, it is just above the eyebrows and the site is accessible. There is more rapid detection of changes than at the fingers. There's a less motion artifact and it cannot be used in head down position due to venous congestion. So what are the um, parts of a pulse oximeter? One, we have a, a probe which has two LED, 660 and 940 nanometers, and they do not require recalibration as they always emit a monochromatic light. And it has a sensing photodiode. There's a cable which connects it to the console, which has a, which provides you audible tone whose pitch changes with or fall or increase in um, SpO2 and it may generate um, an alarm. So according to the US standards, there are some provision which should be provided with the pulse oximeter. There must be a means to limit the duration of continuous operation at a temperature about 41 degrees Celsius. And the accuracy must be stated about 70 to 100% of SpO2. If the manufacturer claims that the 
accuracy is le uh, less than 65, then it should be stated uh, over the additional range. Now the manufacturer may claim that the accuracy is uh, there during the motion or when the perfusion is low or when there is an indication that SPO2 or pulse data is not current. So uh, all the test methods should be established before the instructions for how to use it is given. If the pulse oximeter is provided with any physiological alarm, it should be provided with an alarm system that monitors for the equipment failure. And there must be an alarm for low SpO2 and that is not less than 85% of SpO2. An indication of signal inadequacy may be provided if the SpO2 or pulse rate value displayed is potentially incorrect. If a variable pitch auditory signal is provided to indicate the pulse signal, the pitch signal uh, change shall follow the SpO2 reading. So what are the advantages of pulse oximeters that most of the studies have shown that there's no difference between the saturation as determined by the ABG or pulse oximeter when the SpO2 is more than 70%. It is not affected by anesthetic gases and vapors. There's a fast response time. It is non-invasive. The saturation heart and pulse flow are continuously being monitored. There's a tone modulation. There's a variable pitch of tone in the alarm. If the, the saturation goes down, the alarm tone will be different. It is convenient to use. It is lightweight and it has a fast start time. Within a few beats after the application of probe, the reading is there and it is economical. So um, what happens uh, with the um, SpO2 and PaO2 if we try to correlate it properly? Uh, this is the oxyhemoglobin curve. We all know about it. The upper part of the curve is flat. So there can be significant changes in PO2 without corresponding changes in SpO2 till the PO2 falls to about 60% and uh, 60 millimeter of uh, mercury and below. So, and a valuable time is lost before we should start giving oxygen to this patient. So there could be a failure to detect hypoventilation. The SpO2 does not determine the ETCO2 and it is very common during anesthesia that the patient is getting supplemental oxygen, but at the same time, the patient is hypoventilating and hypercarbia may take place without the changes in oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. Now, there are conditions where the oxyhemoglobin curve may shift. If it may shift to the right during fever and uh, acidosis, therefore, there is a more release of oxygen to the tissues. The PO2 increases, but the SpO2 decreases. It might shift to the left during um, conditions like hypothermia and alkalosis. And again, there's a less release of oxygen tissues. So the SpO2 might increase, but the PO2 may decrease. And there is always a delay in the hypoxic event in detection. Now, what happens uh, in certain scenarios, like if the patient has a blue or a black or a brown or a green nail paint, dirty nails or onchomycosis, onchomycosis is present, the, or there is a henna applied on the hands or there are uh, dyes like uh, methylene blue, intomycin green, indigo. So all these may lead to lower SpO2 readings. But if the patient has a red or a purple nail paint, it does not affect the SpO2 readings. So what could be uh, there if you have electropotry, if the in the same arm or in the same place or in the same line, we have electropotry as well as the pulse oximeter, we have a false interpretation. So it is advised that the electropotry should be placed as far as possible from the pulse oximeter. And we should never plug the pulse oximeter and the electropotry in the same plug. In case of skin pigmentation, there's no difference between the SpO2 between the diet and the dark colored people. And in case if the patient has a severe anemia, there's a tendency of overestimation of SpO2, especially at low saturation. In case of there is a... Um, there's a failure to detect impaired circulation in uh, uh, SP uh, pulse oximeter. And in cases of optical interference due to sunlight, heating lamps, OT lights, xenon lamps, phototherapy, so they can detect different pulse readings to, uh, on the console of oximeter and ECG. Now, coming over to various types of hemoglobins which are present in the body, the met hemoglobin, which is less than 1% of the total hemoglobin, the oxidation production of hemoglobin that forms a reversible complex with oxygen and impairs the unloading of oxygen to the tissues. Methemoglobin presence could be congenital or acquired. And there are drugs which cause methemoglobinemia like nitrobenzene, benzocaine, prilocaine and dapson. So they absorb the light equally at red and infrared wavelengths that is used by most pulse oximeter. An increase in hemoglobin carbon dioxide 
carbon monoxide may occur during laser surgery in the airway, but the levels are not high enough to keep the pulse oximeter from reliable, reliably estimating the saturation. So the pulse oximeters are differentiated between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin and can measure the carboxyhemoglobin are now available. Hemoglobin F does not appear to affect their accuracy to a clinically important degree, although very high levels may cause it to be read slightly slow. Sickle cell anemia is very uh, controversial. Several investigators have concluded that pulse oximeter is inaccurate in these patients and uh, which makes it unreliable for detecting the serious hypoxemia, whereas other studies have found it to be very useful. Self-hemoglobinemia may be caused by drugs and they may uh, articulate uh, artifactually low oxygen saturation may be recorded. In hemoglobin coin, again low oxygen saturation is recorded. Hemoglobin Hammersmith and hemoglobin milk work, uh, they affect the pulse oximeter reading. So it is not very useful. Hemoglobin H saturation, then higher saturation is recorded. In thalassemia 2 patients, the uh, hemoglobin, uh, the pulse oximeter readings are consistently low and in Heinz body hemolytic anemia, uh, again the reading which is, is low. So what happens if you place it in the index finger of the patient, the patient might get up and he might rub his eye causing corneal aberration and uh, the pulse oximeter probe can also lead to pressure and ischemic injuries. It may also cause burns and electric shock. Perfusion index is the ratio of pulsatile flow to the non-pulsatile or static blood in the peripheral tissue. It represents a non-invasive measure of perfusion, uh, peripheral perfusion that can be continuously and non-invasively obtained from a pulse oximeter. A latest technology which has been used in pulse oximeter is the Massimo signal uh, extraction technology which yields continual and simultaneous absolute values and trends with associated alarms for uh, perfusion index and SpO2 and pulse rate using validated signal extraction technology. The signal extraction technology uses five signal processing algorithms to deliver the high precision, sensitivity and specificity in the measurement of blood oxygen saturation levels. The perfusion index parameter can be derived from the core measurement of set and yields clinically useful information regarding the perfusion pressures status of the patient. The under indices of the perfusion index through infrared absorption lacks the sensitivity technology of SET which may limit the index. So what are the current clinical uses of perfusion index? It helps us to know whether the anesthesia is working. Is the epidural block working for the laboring patient or in children undergoing surgery? Is the perfusion index an objective predictor of the illness severity in newborns? and the relationship between perfusion index and calf muscle perfusion in newborns can be measured. So these are some measure uh, parameters which can be obtained by the pulse pressure of uh, plethysmography. That is the heart rate variability, uh, blood pressure estimation, vascular aging index, ankle brinkle pre uh, pressure index and pulse transit time. And it can be affected by all these reasons which I already discussed. So to conclude, over the last 15 years, pulse oximeters have found that these instruments have a reasonable degree of accuracy. And this degree of accuracy coupled with the ease of operation of most instruments has led to the widespread use of pulse oximeter for monitoring. Perhaps a major challenge today we are facing is whether the technology can be incorporated effectively into diagnostic and management of algorithms that can improve and the efficiency of clinical management. Thank you so much. Unmute, sir. Uh, yes. Unmute, sir, please. Dr. Anand, please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Dr. Parul. Yes, sir. Uh, which technology will be better uh, nowadays amongst the all in in terms of specificity and uh, there is a uh, uh, better result? Sir, according to the recent studies which have been done in the epidural analgesic patients where Massimo technique was used, the sensitivity and the specificity was found to be better. 
because it is incorporating the five algorithms which is yeah, incorporating yeah. The, all the wavelengths and everything but uh, i have since i have not used the massimo technique i still go with my old techniques and i prefer using them because i'm very thorough with it <laughs> that's all right ha huh, but nothing can beat a clinical monitoring no that is all right but if we are having the option the uh, the specificity and the other are better with the uh, massimo technique although we whatever is there is better since uh, the yes, introduction in 1980 yeah yeah yes sir, thank yes, you uh, any question from the audience if there is any question from the audience yes sir yeah Yeah, uh, Mr. Mumin sir, I am telling. Uh, the question is: Please explain the disproportion of SpO two and oxyhemoglobin hemoglobin curve. Sir, I will. Okay. Huh. Uh, just a moment. Uh, you want to know about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and how does it affect? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what happens is that if you've seen the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, that curve has a sigmoid uh, uh, sigmoid curve. So what happens during the topmost part of the curve? There is uh, the SpO two and the PO two correlation will remain the same, even if the SpO uh, PO two levels are falling down. The SpO two will constantly be showing you to be around ninety four, ninety five. But when there is a steep fall in the PO two. that time the spo2 levels will start decreasing but at that time it now becomes very difficult to assess and to take care of the patient then so it is very important that we should know what is uh, at what level the things will go down so uh, yeah. i think if the more questions are there they can be the uh, can be asked later on to from dr parul because already is uh, 8:30 Yes, sir. There are no more questions, sir. Can we start the next? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the uh, thank you, Dr. Parul. Uh, the ne next speaker of this uh, session is uh, Dr. Manfred Singh. He is a professor in Department of Anesthesia, Government Medical College and Hospital, Chandigarh, and. Uh, is a very dynamic person involved in so many activities as you can see the starting from uh, emergency medicine fellowship in emergency medicine and so many other like himsa fccp and ams then other multi so many publications the uh, is the instructor and uh, reviewer for more than 25 pubmed and 